I got started with a fellow named Paul Simon, who was a senator before me, and a lieutenant governor and congressman. And uh, so in my early years, when I was running for office for the first time, uh, I used to listen to Paul. He was really a, a great uh, uh, mentor to me. And he used to say, when it comes down to public service, you need two things. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm listening to what other two things you need. You need to be honest. That's a must, he said. And so he started this full income disclosure, net worth disclosure. He was really taught me and I continued the same thing. But the second thing he said was, you've got to be willing to help the helpless. There are people who uh, need things done in legislatures and government who have all the resources to get it done for attorneys and, and lobbyists and all the rest. And there are those who have no one, uh, that have really no voice in the process, and you've got to be that person. And I, I think that to me, those are the simplest definitions, honesty and help the helpless, you know, that really kind of define what I feel about public life and I think what most Democrats feel about. It. Uh, the folks who have a cause and a need and plenty of money, they'll take care of themselves. At least they'll get their day in court. But for the other folks, they may never be heard uh, unless we speak up for them. Mm. That resonates to me, and, and I appreciate that because that, that feels very much what I believe in, what brought me into the role. And even though I'm so new at it, uh, I feel so lucky to be here and to be at the table. And I don't take that, that responsibility lightly. And I think that that's, that's what's also compelled me and propelled me forward as I move into this next step. So. So let me tell you what I think we're going to see November 3rd. I think it's going to be an historic election, not just in terms of the questions and candidates before us, but also in terms of participation and turnout. Mm. It's a super challenge to be in the middle of a pandemic and to decide how to conduct an election in a way that people feel safe and confident that they can cast their votes. Uh, and they've seen plenty of examples around the United States where it's been difficult to vote and they've seen people crowded in polling places and they don't wanna be in those crowded polling places. So the legislature did the right thing, I believe, in opening up the opportunity to vote safely at home. That's what voting by mail is all about. And all the critics of voting by mail and they're generally in the other party, ignore the obvious. People wanna exercise their right to vote and they don't want to endanger their lives or the lives of their family when they do it. So we're going to have a lot of applications for mail-in ballots being sent all around to your district and all around the state. And people can then decide, all right, here's the safe way to do it and to get it done. Mm. And that process starts early, weeks and weeks before the November 3rd election. Uh, and so those of us on the ballot, you know, we've got to do our homework early in the process. Uh, early September instead of early October uh, becomes <laughs> a target area for us to advertise, to mail, to knock on doors, if we can still do that, uh, right. and to make phone calls. But I believe at the, at the end of the day, it's going to be what I consider to be the perfect example of democracy, maximum participation. Uh, and the other party, the Republicans seem to view this differently. They want selected participation. They want voter IDs. They want uh, limited opportunities to vote. They want to limit the time you can vote and, and how you can vote. And I, I think they are really telling us they're afraid of a big turnout of legal voters because they don't think they can win. So they're trying to reduce it. Well, you're probably in an area where there's going to be large voter participation. I imagine historically it has been uh, in your district. It may be, even be greater in, in this cycle, in this election. But I like it. And I'll tell you what I think. I think the numbers, at least today, and we're still about four months out, but at least today, the numbers show uh, it growing support for the Democratic position, growing support for Joe Biden. Uh, in your district, there may be more support for the president. I don't know. You know the district better than I do. But I do believe there'll be ticket splitters and there'll be people looking uh, for new vo voices and new faces. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I think we've heard a lot of the same things, and I hope that that's true. Uh, I know we do have a little bit more of a split here just because it is a rural, largely rural area. And uh, of course, my opponent is, uh, like I said, a very strong Trump supporter. So, and he has a large, you know, and there are people that still like him and uh, still follow him. So I, I'm eyes wide open in what to expect with this, uh, this election. But I appreciate the emphasis on, on voter participation and that, that, 
goal of wanting to make it a very safe process, we've worked the same way tirelessly, pushing out resources. In fact, we just updated the website. So now we have on the front page, mail-in ballot, links to both sites, straight to the page. Here in McHenry County, I was surprised. We have a Republican clerk, um, but it's actually now much easier to apply for the ballot than it was Good. the last cycle. So I'm happy about that. What do you think of the top issues in your district? What do you hear? Yeah, I think that um, the, the top issues for us are healthcare is a big issue. People are really worried about that. The economy right now, um, I've had people reach out to me that are, you know, they still don't have their jobs back. And so now with things starting to end here, they're getting really nervous about what's going to happen with unemployment. School's going back. There is a real, I, it's funny, this has just come up that rather recently, but um, how safe it's going to be to go back to school. Uh, we're going to hold a town hall, I think, in the next few weeks with a couple educators to talk about that. Um, and taxes remain an issue for us out here in this part of Illinois. So we is do have- Property taxes primarily? Yeah. We have high property okay. taxes and, uh, and we rely on them for a lot. So I think that that's, a, that's another concern. When you think about healthcare, uh, this pandemic has created a new element uh, in that we talked in Washington about protection if you or your family member has a pre-existing condition. Now, a COVID-19 uh, uh, infection uh, of that virus it could easily become a pre-existing condition. We are still mm -hmm. trying to figure out, uh, does it just make you sick, sick temporarily or could it be worse? And in some cases it is worse, even mm -hmm. for children. Uh, and we're trying to sort that out. Well, the Affordable Care Act said, the health insurance company cannot discriminate against Suzanne Mess because uh, she or someone in her family had tested positive at some point. You can't charge her a higher premium. You can't refuse coverage for her and her family. Uh, okay. That to me is sacred because there's hardly a family on earth that doesn't have some story of somebody in the family who has dealt with an issue, whether it's asthma or diabetes or surviving cancer, for goodness sakes. So that to me is the first line of defense when we talk about the Affordable Care Act is pre-existing conditions. Uh, and there are so many other aspects to it. When it comes to the economy, uh, we did something on March 26, which was nothing short of historic. In a matter of eight days, we wrote a bill that cost $3 trillion. That's about 60% of the federal domestic discretionary budget. And we put money into unemployment benefits federal unemployment benefits, and into a, a small business loan program, forgivable loans, and injected massive amounts of money. We've never seen uh, these levels before, but we felt we needed to do it, and we did. Mm -hmm. And it worked, at least temporarily worked. Now we've got to return to it. We're going to go back to Washington in about 10 days, and we have three weeks of session to renew the unemployment benefits. They expire at the end of July. I want to renew them. I think we've got to find a way to do it. There may be a different approach, but we've got to help unemployed families get through this tough period. And when it comes to businesses, particularly small businesses, uh, we have changed the forgivable loan program once. We may change it again. So that, for example, the restaurant industry, just opening their doors legally now to sit down customers, uh, mm -hmm. it, it really tentatively moving forward with a reduced number of customers, reduced revenues, can they make it? And it could be just a little bit of a helping hand is all they need to move forward. So in terms of getting the economy moving forward, those are two things, the unemployment benefits for the workers out of work and the helping hand for the businesses reopening now are the two things that I think we need to focus on. I, and I would agree. We have a lot of smaller businesses in this district. Uh, there's a lot of smaller villages and municipalities. I think one of the struggles locally that, we, that I've seen, at least at this level, is how that money gets dispersed or disseminated to those entities. McHenry County did a couple of unique things about that, and we made, we created actually a, sustain, a small business sustainability grant with some of our discretionary funds to be able to do that. Um, but the, the communication and getting that out in Kane County, that's not been the same thing. So I see the position I'm walking into as being that regional leadership to be able to bring some of those entities together so that they start to share that out because I think that's the big, exactly what you said. It's great that the federal government is doing these things, and now we need boots on the ground here to get that to people that need it most and identifying them. So 
I, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I'm happy to hear that. I think people will be happy to hear that uh, and know that you're working on that. The first round of forgivable small business loans, the big banks jumped in and they understood it. They had the applications and they had this wealth of clients and customers that they knew uh, what kind of businesses they had and what they might be needing money for. And so that was the first round was dominated by the larger and well-established businesses. Unfortunately, the smaller ones, the ones that were struggling, uh, didn't have similar advocacy when it came to the banking industry. So we had to do a kind of a second round, put more money in and say, now we're going to go to community banks and credit unions and uh, uh, consumer uh, advisory, uh, CDFI, consumer development, whatever, financial institutions. <laughs> and we're, we're going to have them do counseling for small businesses so they can get in on this helping hand. And it worked. We still got about $130 billion left. We need it, as I mentioned earlier, for the extension of some of these loans. Uh, but we've got to make sure that we focus on the main street businesses that may have been passed over in the first round. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that's great. And, and I can't tell you the numbers, um, though there's quite a bit uh, here in this district of small people that work out of their homes and some of those under five employees. Uh, so I think that that's good news and will be good news too. And I'm happy, I'm happy I can share that and bring great. that to people as I'm talking to them. Good. Yeah. What, now you said you have a rural district. Are there any, any or many farms in the district? There are some. We're certainly surrounded by, uh, the district is rural. surrounded by rural, uh, but parts of like even Huntley and the western part of this district, there are some smaller farms and in Kane County too. So I think those issues impact us because they're border issues, right? We, we Yes. We now there's also them. always been some infrastructure battles going on in that world as to extension of highways and the like. I, I usually try to find something that everybody agrees on and bring in some federal funding. There are some highway project extensions and expansions that everyone does not agree on. Is that still the case? <laughs> oh, yes. I, I don't know if you know the Longmeadow Parkway bridge across the Fox River. Are you familiar with that one? No, tell me. So I don't, and I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about it, but it took years and years for them to get it. But it's another bridge across the Fox because we have, you know, 72 and Algonquin Road. And it's just, it's tough. Traffic logs, backlogs, the whole thing. So they finally, local officials wanted to build this Long Meadow Parkway. They had to buy up land, all of those things that go into it. There was a lot of pushback for it, but they finally got it done. Uh, th though, not, they, they missed out on some of the capital infrastructure money that they could have utilized for it. So there's talk of making it a toll road, a, a toll use bridge, because they didn't get some of the capital money that this role should have fought for. And, uh, and so, but it, it's finally going in. It needed to be done. But it's one where locally people just don't agree. I believe when they see the benefit of it and how it helps with backlogs and travel time, I think people will come around. But getting to that point was tough, so. Are you, are you familiar with the SALT deduction? Does that ring a bell with you? It is, a it, was a, it was a deduction in the, on the federal taxes, which said you can deduct the state and local taxes that you paid. In other words, if you pay your property tax, as people do, uh, that that is a deduction on your federal return. The argument behind it was, why would you be double taxed? That you not only pay the tax, but then not get a credit for it, uh, or a deduction rather, from your uh, federal income level. Uh, and so as part of the Trump tax reform, they took away the SALT deduction for many people. Uh, and we are trying to restore it. It was part of the HEROES Act that uh, passed the House of Representatives about seven or eight uh, weeks ago. Uh, I, I think it is reasonable to do that. And it really is an effort at the federal level to uh, lessen the tax burden so people don't get taxed twice, uh, pay the tax and then pay a tax on paid taxes. Uh, so that's one of the issues that's being debated in Washington as well. That would be great. That in the cap of the 10,000 property tax, you know, if you pay over that amount, you don't get the write-off for that. I know um, Representative Underwood's been working on that one and Sean Caston as well, because that's impacted this area quite a bit too. So those that's are, great. that's good news. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> get that done. Yay. <laughs> so tell me, uh, as we wrap up here, tell me what campaigning is like in your district 
in the age of COVID-19? Yeah, well, you know, uh, initially it was um, a lot of going and mobilizing into making sure people had access to resources. Uh, we did a few wellness calls, but everybody started doing those pretty early on. So I helped with things like delivering meals and making sure people knew, you know, where those were at. We changed, we made sure we had access to all of that on our website and social media outlets. Um, and then largely just we, we sort of set back a little bit to see we weren't even meeting on our county uh, meetings and things like that. Um, but since we've really ramped up our reaching out through social media, through phone calls, through uh, Zoom calls like this, I've had a number of these Zoom calls and continue to have these. We're bringing together people, smaller groups on these calls. So being able to talk about things, um, but, and then letters, we just did a whole appeal letter that went out to uh, 300 households. So first round, we have a plan in place to do more of that. So it's, you know, little by little, we're, I don't, and I'm also doing, I'm called run the district. So I can't knock on your door, but I can run through your neighborhood because I'm a runner. So oh, I'm 20 miles from my house to Springfield. Uh, and I have a little pin board, I'm looking at my map. So I, I mark all the precincts I've been in so far. And people that, we kind of let a few people know, they come out and wave and, Get people to put yard signs out again. So we're, we're having some fun that way. But um, yeah, those are the things we've been doing. Suzanne, I wish you the best. You'll be a terrific state representative. And, Thank you so much. Thank look you for forward to working time. with I you. It. I look forward to it you. as well. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.